time a little bit from Galileo. To the time of Tycho Brahe. That's this guy right here. Can you say Tycho Brahe? Tycho, Tycho Brahe. Y'all would have liked Tycho. That's a nice name. They Tycho Brahe was a Dutch astronomer. And um, he was a really rich guy. He was one of the richest guys in Europe. And his hobby was looking at the stars. Now, he lived before the telescope was invented. The late 1500s. Um is when he was doing his work. You can see he only lived to 56 years old. Okay. But, um, so he did all of his observations um, using uh, devices called uh, quadrants and, and um, sextants. Have you all ever heard of that? A quadrant is a device where you can set it on a flat table and you could change, it's kind of almost like a protractor. You can change the level and then it has a little hole you look through and you can see the angle to the star and how high it is in the sky. And you can, they had uh, observatories, as a matter of fact, he built an observatory where the room, you, as you go around the room, you can look and see what kind of direction you're pointed. So he could figure out where the star is in the sky. He could figure out the direction around the room this way, and you know, degrees, and the angle to the star he's looking at. And he would record this for all the stars that he saw. And he did that diligently each night for everything he saw in the sky. So he could tell, okay, on this night, this star was here. On this night, this planet was here. On the next night, the planet was a little bit over and exactly how far over it was. And he charted the movement of all the planets a lot more meticulously than it had ever been charted before. Tycho Brahe. He had the best astronomical uh, data of any human. And um, he, was, he was a big partier, this is why I say he would have liked him. He's a big partier. He had huge parties at his house. He uh, he was real. Um, it, it, well, he's kind of a weird dude. Like he kept a dwarf under the table, and he would bring the dwarf out and dance around and do tricks and, and humor and stuff. And he then he make it go back under the table, make it make him. He uh, he had a moose that he got really drunk, and the moose the moose got drunk. <laughs> the moose, he, he'd feed the moose beer and the moose would get drunk and um, one time the moose fell down the stairs and died. Oh. The moose was going to be a gift to like a prince or something in it. He had these crazy parties. He lost his nose in a duel. One night after, during a party, he was drinking and he got upset with like a cousin of his or something and so they were going to duel it out with swords. His cousin cut off his nose. In the end, for the last, I don't know, 20, 30 years, he, he wore a fake nose that was made of gold. He said it was made of gold, but when they dug up, they, they, re they exhumed his body not too long ago, and they checked, and it turned out the fake nose was like, it was like fake gold. <laughs> Copper or something like that. So he, he got busted for the fake nose. 300 years later. Um, yeah, he was kind of a kind of an eccentric guy, and um, he, but his data, he wasn't he wasn't that great of math, and so he had all this data, but he wanted to figure out if you could predict the movements of all the planets, and he had an assistant that was real good at math. His assistant that he hired was named Johannes Kepler. Have y'all ever heard of Kepler's laws? So Kepler knew about this guy's data and wanted this guy's data, all of his data, to figure out the movement of the planet. But Brahe was kind of stingy with his data. And Brahe was like, no, you can't have all the data. You can just have some of it. He gave him little bits at a time. And Kepler, let's see if Kepler, see in the next picture? Oh, there's, a, there's the quadrant that I was talking about. That's the device that 
measures the angle to the star and so forth. That's what he used. Is that that's guess uh, Brahe too? Let's see what this is. This might be about Brahe's life. astronomical observations, but in his day, he was equally famous for his soap opera-like life. During his life, Brahe made the most precise planetary observations in existence, over an order of magnitude better than previous measurements. As this was before the invention of the telescope, he made all his measurements with the naked eye, using an enormous instrument called the neural quadrant, which measured the angle of a star from the meridian, along with the sidereal time of observation. But at 20, Brahe became known for another bizarre feat, a duel with a fellow nobleman in which he lost his nose. He would spend the rest of his life wearing replacement noses of copper, silver, or gold attached to paste. But having a nose of gold didn't stop him from achieving success. In 1572, he observed a distant supernova, which prompted him to rethink the current view of an unchanging universe and write the critical book, De Stella Nova the new star. This won him the favor of the king of Denmark, who, naturally, gave him an island on which to build a castle and a humongous observatory. Tycho struggled to form his data into a cohesive model of the universe, ultimately dying unsuccessful in 1601. But the drama doesn't stop there. His cause of death, following a large banquet, was first believed to be overindulgence, or perhaps a bladder infection. But analysis of his mustache hairs in 1991 revealed that Brahe absorbed a large dose of mercury several hours before his death and may in fact have been poisoned. One possible suspect? Brilliant theoretician Johannes Kepler. Brahe had long viewed Kepler as an intellectual rival, withholding the bulk of his data from him, and the two quarrels repeatedly. After Brahe's death, Kepler gained access to this crucial data bringing about a complete reformation of astronomy by abandoning models of circular orbits in favor of elliptical. Kepler, possible evil genius, and the perfect ending to Tycho Brahe's extraordinary life. Huh. So Kepler, who was Brahe's assistant, there he is, he may have poisoned Brahe because Brahe wouldn't give him all the data. They don't, there's no way to go back and prove that for sure, um, but they did find, like she said, a bunch of mercury in um, Brahe's body right before he died. Um, Brahe, being so rich, had a lot of enemies, and they don't know that Kepler would have done that, and it could have been that Brahe accidentally consumed mercury which happened to a good number of people back then. I'm not sure why they had all this mercury around, but... Yeah, how would you accidentally consume I'm not sure, that's a good question. But accidental poisons back then were real common. Um, so, uh, they didn't have everything marked, you know, and in bottles like we do with labels on them and stuff like that. So, you might have tried to drink one thing and accidentally Another. Who knows? But anyway, um, once Kepler got Brahe's data, Kepler set about trying to figure out the motions of the planets. And what Kepler noticed was that um, at the time the thinking was if the uh, heliocentrism was correct, which Kepler believed. Remember, heliocentrism, Copernicus said everything goes around the sun. Y'all remember this? Mm -hmm. Let me get the light here so I can show it a little better. You can see it a little better, especially for the camera. So let's say here's the sun, and here is the earth. Make the sun bigger. Let's make the sun bigger. Here's the sun, and here's the earth. 
and the Earth goes around the Sun. Well, according to Copernicus, all the planets go around the Sun, and the Sun is still. But at the time, it was thought that all planets go around the Sun in circles. They said the circle is the perfect shape. That was what was thought by, back then. And the data kind of showed that they did go around in circles. But if they went around in circles, then you could, using math, you could predict where a planet would be at some point in the future. Are you with me, Amy, over there? Aubrey, y'all with me? Yeah. So if, if this planet was here, if it does go around the sun in a circle, it should be here a certain amount of time later. But Kepler, when he used Brahe's great data, because he had charted the planets every night, he found out that it, it didn't work. The planets here now, it wasn't where it should be a month later a if it moved in circles. It, it just didn't work. The circles didn't work. And Kepler uh, worked like crazy to try and figure out if they don't go in circles, where are they going? Well, as it turned out, um, Kepler figured out that they move in ellipses, not circles. Now, an ellipse is a flattened circle. And here's a planet moving in an ellipse. It's, that's not a perfect circle. Is that easily seen that that's not a perfect circle? Yeah. It's a flattened circle. And the flattened circle helped explain the data a lot better than a perfect circle. Now, Kepler was working before calculus was invented. And calculus is, an easy, is a much easier method for figuring out curved, uh, curved motion and stuff like that. But uh, Kepler worked without calculus, and so it was very difficult. It took him years to figure out that uh, planets move in ellipses. So what I want you to do, I want you to draw an ellipse. And so I'll show you how to do that. Um, Let's, can, can you leave the uh, leave that on? And why don't you come in here and film yourself drawing an ellipse for the people? This won't take long. Let's go into the uh, the lab and bring it. Bring a pencil or a pen. You can use a pen. And come on in the lab. Just follow me in here. We'll do this quickly. string on one end, leave some slack, 
Put the pin in through the string on the other end. See what I'm saying? So you have two points. And then you take a pin. Can I borrow your pin? Creesh. Oh. This pin. <laughs> and you, you put it on the string like this. And you trace all the way around like this. And then you have to go on the other side. Pretty neat. How cool is this? And look what we have here. Oh, mine is, this is, the, mine is so much better than what y'all are going to draw. Look at that. That's a flattened circle. Uh, that's try it. Like, Isn't that cool? Isn't that good? Everybody try it. Try some string. String. You want to use my piece? Yeah. There you go. So here, I'll cut you some string. I just want you to try that. And whoever gets the best one wins. Wins what? I don't know. Do we get candy? Affection. The, the pride oh, of having a great ellipse drawing scale. Mine has jellyfishes and stuff already on my Are you serious? Yeah. yeah. I said when you don't have any jellyfish, I'm always talking about that. Here you go. This is fucking great. There you go. One piece? Oh, look at you, you sharpie, bitch. You're fine enough. Oh, you're fine. Dude, I can't video That's myself. The video you, you Chris. Mm -hmm. Oh, you want to do? This is too much pressure. I know. You can do as much as you want. I'm not the person in the video. The less slack you use, the flatter the circle will be. So does that mean better? No, I don't have this better. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Make, it, make sure it pulls tightly on the, on the pin. Oh, you didn't have your string, your thing down enough. Common mistake. The less slack you have, the flatter the circle will be. Oh, my string is there. Not necessarily. Good. Has no good or bad value. Look at you. Oh, yeah. Okay, Oh, thank you. No, give it back. So you gotta hold it tight. Give it back. I'm gonna try this one more time. You gotta do it tight. Hey, you want a bigger piece? Yeah, I do. This is a sharp one. Have you even done one yet? I don't think the last one is I'm trying. You could try to find that thing. Nice. Dude, yeah, I could record two hours. Oh, thanks, Jack. That's one of, that's, that's a good ellipse over here. Wait, not yet. Beautiful ellipse. Alright. You got it? No. Very nice. Good. I like it. After you've drawn your ellipse and I've seen it. Now this is masterful. The technique on this. Yeah. You want to draw this? You can start anywhere. As long as you just roll the tide. Never in my life have I seen such a beautiful creation. There you go. Now you're doing it. Can we go back to the room. You can go back to the room. We're going to continue with Kepler. Yeah, now you're doing it. Let's see your lips. Yeah, there you go. Now you're doing it. You're doing it. Yeah. Now that's an ellipse. Don't ever say, I never drew an ellipse. Because you're doing one now. Put that on my resume. There you go. That's it. That's what Kepler figured out. <laughs> Took him eight years. <laughs> Took him eight years to figure out what you did in a few seconds. Good job. I kind of... Yeah, you yeah, messed but, up the but, first but time. The out. second time you got it. Put the cardboard up and... Uh, oh, I wish I got to keep my cards. Put your... Uh... You get it? 
Can I stop filming? Oh, now we're gonna oh. finish. We're finishing, all right. Oh, yeah. If you stop, it'll be in two, two portions. I got to watch the second. Mine's so good. I put my nipple on it. Is that not bad? Is this not good or what? Sweet! You know that's good. Make sure you tell your students in the present that uh, my initials is on this and my favorite. Okay. Very nice. Very good. Appreciate it. I'm not going to eat this one. Go back. All right. So, listen. So Kepler figured out that the planets move in ellipses, not circles. And that gave a much better prediction of future positions. Now, when you're looking, at, if, if you are just looking at the orbit of the Earth around the sun, it looks like a circle. But it's not. It's, a, it's slightly an ellipse. Planets are mostly circular, just slight ellipses. While comets and asteroids can be very tight ellipses. So it just depends on the body that's, that's orbiting. And Kepler figured this out. So that was Kepler's first law that the planets orbit in ellipses, not circles. Kepler's second law. Keep up with this now. Pay attention here. This is a little tougher. Kepler's second law is that a planet will sweep out an area a planet will sweep out equal areas of the ellipse in equal times. So here's what that means. If this planet goes from this point to that point in time t, let's say time t is one month. Uh, Amy and Aubrey, I've got to look at this because you won't be able to understand it just by reading it. Is that my computer? Yeah, but... but Look up here what I'm explaining. So if it takes one month for a planet to go from there to there, then the planet has swept out, uh, Kepler would say, this dark area. So, so you darken the area going all the way to the sun within the time period of, let's say, one month. And notice that it moves. This area right here is equal to this area here. The planet sweeps out a thinner slice of the ellipse the further it is away from the sun. What this means is the planet moves faster near the sun than it does further away. So, so the, the, the thing is orbiting like this. It goes, it, it's, it's slow over here and then fast and then slowing down, slowing, slowing. And then it speeds up. You see what I'm saying? It's not traveling at the same speed the whole time. It's not a constant speed. It's faster near the sun than it is far from the sun. And, and, and Kepler figured out there was a mathematical relationship. The area that swept out in a certain amount of time is equal. So that area there, if you calculate that area, that's equal to this area here. Does that make sense? And, and how does it say in the reading? I don't have the actual words in front of me. What does it say for Kepler's second law? An imaginary line connecting a planet and the sun sweeps out equal areas during equal time intervals. Therefore, the Earth's orbit speed varies at different times of the year. The Earth moves fastest in its orbit when the closest to the sun and slowest when the farthest away. Kepler's second law of planetary motion was calculated for Earth, then the hypothesis was tested using data from from Mars and it worked. Nice. Should we, are we doing math? No, there's no math. You just have to understand. I'm not going to give you a mathematical problem. I'm just looking at like the third law. Well, we'll get to the third law in a second. But isn't that cool? Kepler discovered that without calculus. 
cal you need calculus to figure out the, the area under a curve. Has anyone here taken calculus? Have you have y'all done any of that yet? No. No? Okay. Well, he did it without calculus, which is very tough math. He actually were, was cutting out pieces and measuring the size and stuff um, in his models. It took him like eight years. Okay, and then the third, Kepler's third law was that if the planet is orbiting farther from the sun, it orbits slower. So here is showing uh, uh, four different bodies. This one close to the sun, that's Mercury. And that one for a little further out, that's Venus. And then this one further out, that's Earth. And this one even further out, that's Mars. And you can see for all of them, the closer you are to the sun, the faster it moves. That's Kepler's third law. Closer you are to the sun, the faster you move. The further you are from the sun, the slower you move. And so using all these three laws he made, he could predict the future location of a planet way better than anyone else could. And to prove he was right, he predicted a uh, he predicted that Mercury, the planet Mercury, would go in front of the sun at a certain point in time. That Mercury would kind of move across the sun or block out the sun, and he predicted it for the, a future time period. It's called a transit. Mercury would transit the sun, would go in front of it. Now, you can't look at the sun and see Mercury with your naked eyes, but if you put on sunglasses, many sets of them, you can. And um, uh, Kepler predicted this, that Mercury would transit the sun. And especially using a telescope, you would be able to see it happen. And they did have telescopes when uh, this prediction was going to take place. And so they waited and waited until the time of the prediction, and sure enough, Mercury went in front of the sun. No one else had predicted. It's like the guy's predicting the future. And when he did that, he was like, see? All the other models with the circle, with the circular orbits were way off. Mercury wasn't anywhere near the sun. But his prediction with the ellipses and the speeds go right across the sun at this time on this day, and it happened. Bam! Yes. Yes. He was alive when that prediction came true, and he was like, I'm the man. He just watched it happen. He, I think he did watch it happen. Let's watch a video. I'm not, I'm not positive that he watched it happen. <coughs> but, but they knew he was right. <coughs> so this is video about Kepler. Hold on, loose leg. Hold on, loose leg. You know that song? 